So, you want to run at people five levels below you with half your items and think you're good at this game? Well then, being a solo laner is for you. As you might have seen from the title, this is a comprehensive guide to the solo lane for Smite Season 5. Here's the stuff I'm going to be covering in the order I'm going to be covering it. First up, the very basics of the role, followed by your role in the game and your team comp as a solo laner, followed by roughly what type of gods and items you should be looking at for the solo lane. After that, the dynamics of the laning phase. This section goes way more in depth than any of the others into the nuances of the solo lane and the laning phase, and it will be broken down into more specific subsections later on to make it easier to follow. And finally, we'll round it out with team play and late game team fights. I'll leave timestamps on screen to all of the sections if you just want to watch a specific bit, and if you're already familiar with the very basics of solo lane, I'd suggest skipping to the gods and items section, since the first two sections are really basic, just kind of an introduction to the role. But without further ado, let's get right into it with the basics of the role. So I'm sure a lot of you watching know where the solo lane is, but for the sake of the few who don't, the solo lane is the side lane closest to the fire giant, here. It's also defined by being the lane where the two towers are closer together where there's less space between them. As you may have suspected, the solo lane most of the time is a 1v1 between two gods. Some key skills you need for this role would be boxing and trading, effective farming techniques, a wide god pool including being able to play tanks well, and a lot of matchup knowledge which generally just comes from playing a lot as a solo laner. Alright, moving on to your role in the game. In Smite, the solo laner is almost always a tank. So be ready to play a lot of warriors and guardians if you want to play this role effectively. Of course the lane is open to more gods than just tanks, but if you really want to be good at the role, I suggest sticking to tanks, at least while you learn the role. The tank role is essential to any team comp, and so playing that role allows you to be the best asset to the team that you can be when playing the solo lane. We'll get deeper into what exactly you should be doing as these gods further into the guide, but as a basic rule you should be playing tanks. Okay, moving on to gods and items. In terms of gods, of course, as I mentioned before, you'll be playing tanks for the most part. Literally any warrior is fine for solo lane, but there's also a few guardians, the most prominent of which are Artio, Jingchen, Sobek, and Cerberus. You might also see the odd Athena, Ymir, or Kuzumbo too in the solo lane. The thing that makes these particular guardians more successful where others in the class aren't is their above average lane clear and often they have some decent sustain as well. As we'll learn later, sustain and wave clear along with boxing potential are some of the most important things to look for in a solo lane god. I'll also quickly mention you might see the odd assassin in solo. They'll usually build quite tanky to compete with you and will mostly consist of Ratatoska, Thor, Thanatos, Fenrir and Kamazots. But I won't worry about them, 99% of your games are going to be warriors and guardians, so just focus on warriors and those 7 guardians that I mentioned. Okay, on to items. I'm going to talk first about relics before going into items. There's a wide pool of relics that solo laners can make use of. I'd say the most popular ones right now are probably Shell, Horrific Emblem and Heavenly Wings. But you can also try Frenzy as well. All 4 of these relics can affect an entire team, be it buffing your team up or debuffing the enemy team. I'd say these are the essential 3 or 4 relics to have for team fights, so I suggest you pick up at least one of these for yourself, maybe even two if you don't need other relics. Other options that aren't as universal but can be good in certain niche situations are Teleport, Meditation, Blink, Cursed Ankh, Thorns and Phantom Veil. Vale. Teleport isn't used too much but it does give you an easy way back to lane, teleporting to your tower if you get pushed out often. But keep in mind you will have to buy teleport upgrade to be able to teleport to wards. Meditation is an alternative to shell kind of that gives you more sustain. Blink can be a good engage tool on gods like Kukulun, Jingchen and Yamiya that use it to engage and land their CC. Cursed Ankh is always good against healers. Thorns is good against Hunters and basic attack based assassins, and Phantom is good against Odin. I'd stay away from Beads and Aegis most of the time, they can be marginally useful sometimes, but as a tank you usually don't need these. I would also stay away from Sunder and Brazer for the most part too, there's just better relics to get for teamfights. I'd say my go to relic setup on most gods is Shell and Heavenly Wings, so if you just need a quick and effective relic choice you can go for those two. Alright, on to item builds. I can't cover a build for every god, so I'll just suggest some items that are good pickups on most of the gods you're going to see. In terms of blessings, on a tanky god, you'll be fine with Warrior's Blessing most of the time. This gives you extra survivability with protections, damage reduction and healing all in the same item. 
Is it worth pick up on every tank solo laner really, but there's others you can use sometimes. Mage's Blessing gives you a wave clear advantage as an ability based god, and Hunter's Blessing can sometimes be useful on niche characters. But be aware that you sacrifice a lot of survivability by not getting Warrior's Blessing, and you might lose a sustained fight against a solo laner that has it. You'll need boots of course. Warrior Tabai is a choice for pretty much every warrior. Ninja Tabai can see some niche use on basic attack gods like Erlang Shen or Bologna, but any ability based warrior definitely wants Warrior Tabai. Guardians can depend, cooldown or penetration boots can both be useful. Take your pick if you want more damage or more CDR and mana. One thing to be aware of though is that cooldown boots may limit your build choices later on when buying CDR items, since it's pretty easy to hit 40% CDR without the boots, but you can get them if you feel it's necessary. Reinforced Greaves are also worth a mention if you want more tankiness on your warriors. I wouldn't recommend them on Guardians all too much, but if you feel you don't need the power from Warrior Tabby early game, you can go into Reinforced Greaves to be really tanky as a warrior, if you combine that with something like Warrior's Blessing. Against physical solo laners, Breastplate of Valor and Gladiator Shield are great early pickups. Gladiators is great on most ability based warriors for sustain, especially gods like Sun Wukong and Kukulun that can repeatedly hit abilities and proc its effect and Breastplate is useful across pretty much every god because of its CDR and mana. Mystical Mail is another option for physical defense, but I personally prefer Breastplate in this meta for the CDR and mana. Against a Magical Laner, Genji's Guard is great, and Pestilence is good against a healer. You can also pick up Spirit Robe or Hide of the Urchin, or even Mantle of Discord to have defense against both the jungler and the solo laner. After you're done with your first item, anything from the Cloak Tree except Magi's Blessing is a great choice. Son of Gaia gives good sustain, Void Stone is great for Guardians, Shogun's Kasari is great on most gods if your support doesn't already have one. And of course the usual counter items apply such as Nemean and Midgardia Mail against basic attack gods, Pest ones against healers, stuff like that. You can also pick up some of offensive options such as Frostbound Hammer, Void Shield, Shifter Shield, etc. But limit yourself to one of these at the maximum as you need to be very tanky for team fighting and conquest. I'd say 4 defense items is the bare minimum for most games. Moving on to the dynamics of the learning phase. So now we've covered what to play and what to build, let's talk about what to actually do in the laning phase. This section will be quite a bit more in depth as the laning phase in solo is a huge part of whether you're a successful solo laner or not, so let's get right into it. I'm going to split this section up into a number of subsections to make it a bit simpler to understand. We'll cover minions first as they're one of the most important things to master in solo lane. Then we'll move on to level 1 fighting, trading and boxing, ganks and warding, invading and recalling. A vast majority of the time, solo lane is, well, a solo lane. There's just you versus the enemy laner and no one else for miles, except those pesky little minions. Solo lane more than any other role needs to know how to play with and manipulate minions to do their bidding. You need to understand how much damage minions can put out, roughly of course, don't try memorising and recalling minion damage values for every level, that's not going to go well. But you need a rough idea for the first few levels how much minions can do to you and how much they can do to your opponent. Knowing this can allow you to make power plays using the minions. A good example of this is Bologna. At level 1, Bologna will take Bludgeon and go to clear the wave. She can tag the enemy god with the spin of Bludgeon in order to take minion aggro. This way, she herself might take a bit more damage, but she keeps her own minion wave safe because the enemy minions will target her instead. Doing so will allow her to outclear almost anyone at level 1 and take her early lead into the jungle or start poking the enemy out a bit. But pulling minion aggro can often be quite dangerous. Going back to the Bologna example, if she's learning against a Hercules, taking minion aggro at level 1 is normally a bad idea. A good Hercules will save his driving strike and recognise that you pulled minions, then driving strike you into a wall. This will stop you from clearing and you'll still get hit by his entire wave plus he stuns you for 1.1 seconds with driving strike. That combined with his own damage will probably result in you getting first blooded or losing a good chunk of your HP. That's what solo lane is all about really, analysing your matchup and playing accordingly. The Bologna has to change up her strategy in a matchup like Hercules that can cancel her bludgeon. Of course, minions aren't just there to kill people. They're worth a significant amount of gold and will be a main source of farm for the early game. The best piece of advice I can give you is to prioritise your wave. Before doing anything else, ensure the wave is cleared and you have that farm secured. You can then think about going into the jungle or looking to pick fights. Farm is the most important aspect of solo lane, especially when you're learning. If you can farm better than your opponent, you can even make up for a substantial mechanical skill gap by just being a level and a half up on your opponent the entire game. If minions take damage from a tower, they lose gold value and are only worth 3 gold when they die. This is why prioritising clearing waves is key in lane. If you're off clearing a jungle buff somewhere and you lose 4 minions to tower but the enemy gets the full 6, you're at a pretty severe disadvantage. 
Also, when we're talking about minions, it's worth mentioning last hitting and proxy farming. Last hitting is basically what it says on the tin, last hitting the minions to get extra gold. This also has applications with lane freezing, which is where you essentially just stall the waves and let them kill each other and just take the last hits for the bonus gold and not push the wave to the enemy tower. This could be useful if they're kind of tower camping or something or if they're out of their lane and you can get your minions to die when they're not in the lane. That way they lose gold, but you don't. And then proxy farming is essentially just killing the enemy wave behind their tower. This is more relevant in solo than in other roles because you're often tanky enough and have enough mobility to get out if people come for you but you essentially just kill the wave behind the tower which then makes the enemy have to stay in lane or your wave will push in the tower and you can then make rotations or take jungle buffs or things off of that because you don't have to worry about the enemy wave because you cleared it already just prioritize those minions boy I could go on forever about the nuances of minions, but I'll leave it there for the sake of your sanity. oh actually one more tip before we move on respect the archers as you can see here, archers do over twice the damage per hit of melee minions, but also have significantly less health. This means you can kill them fairly easily and eliminate over two thirds of the wave's damage by killing just three of the minions. Doing this will make your wave take less damage from the enemy wave and will also allow you to play aggressive as melee minion damage is pretty low, especially if you have warrior's blessing. So once the archers are dead, you can kind of just do what you want. So as promised, let's talk about the level one fighting lane. Often the first level and the first minion wave or two can completely decide a learning phase. Don't give up immediately if you get first blooded and like I don't get complacent if you draw first blood, but the level 1 fights are the most risky and also most important part of the learning phase. The first thing you need to think about is how fast you can clear. If you have a clear speed advantage at the first wave over your enemy, you can probably play more aggressive and target the enemy archers ASAP. This gives you the advantage of being able to go into the jungle and hit level 2 or poke the enemy out and force them to lose gold under tower. However, if you're on the receiving end and have worse clear, just play it safe. Use your stuff on the wave and as soon as the enemy is almost done clearing, just back up to tower line. You'll either lose a bit of gold or have to tank archer damage, but it's better than dying at level 1 to 3 archers because you lost clear. If you win clear, go hit level 2 as soon as you can, so you have the advantage going into wave 2 because you have 2 abilities. If you lose clear, play wave 2 really safe and just try to hit level 2 as fast as you can and get your second ability to clear a bit faster. On to trading and boxing. So going into level 2 and beyond, you're going to be boxing and trading with the enemy laner quite a lot. Boxing and trading basically mean the same thing, it's just a 1v1 slap fight. The minions come into this again as you can use them to pressure your opponent. If you win clear, you can be aggressive into the enemy wave if you have enough sustain to do so. Generally, if you lose the clear, try to avoid boxing the enemy too much until you can full clear the archer minions. As you now know, they do most of the wave's damage, so when you can insta-clear those, you can start to look to box a bit more. Don't try to box the enemy when they have archers and you don't in the early game, that's just a surefire way to die. Boxing is all about knowing matchups and builds, which comes with time and experience. You'll have to know your clear and damage potential in the early levels and your enemies and know which trades you should take and which you should avoid. But a general rule is that if you're losing clear, try to avoid boxing too much, and if you're winning clear, force the issue, poke them out, invade their shit, all this stuff. On to ganks. As with any lane, ganks are a potential threat and something to be aware of. Ganks can happen in literally any situation, so be prepared for them. If the enemy is ahead, they might gank to snowball the lane even further in their favour. If the enemy is behind, they'll likely gank to try and bring their soul laner back into it a little bit and not get them too far behind. And if you're even, they might look for ganks to swing the lane one way or another. Likewise, these can all apply to you as well, so make sure you're aware of your team's positioning. Mostly your jungler, but your entire team really except the ADC is open for rotations. And vice versa with the enemy team. Grab wards and hope your mid and support will also be warding mid for some extra information. Um, maybe your jungler has some deep wards to spot rotations and enemy jungler positions and things. I suggest these certain spots for effective anti-gank wards in solo, as well as just general info on when and where the enemy team are moving to. Be aware of any global or semi-global ultimates that the enemy team might have, like Defender of Olympus or Anvil of Dawn. There's a good chance wards might not catch these in time, and you may just have to react when it happens. Try to pay attention to the map and the enemy's mannerisms, like try to predict when these types of ult might be coming your way, and perhaps don't sit on the enemy tower line if you have a hunch there's a Thor about to dunk on you. A lot of knowledge of ganks and warding will transfer from other roles, especially ADC since it's generally quite similar in terms of warding and getting ganked. You're just in a bit less danger as a tank than a squishy hunter might be. I'll just briefly touch on invading. I feel like there's not that much to talk about here. At the base level, invading is simply killing enemy jungle camps to deny them farm and increase your farm. In solo lane, the most relevant invade for you is always the enemy blue buff. 
This is especially pulling against gods that need the blue buff to stay in lane and farm, such as Guan Yu and Tia, who cast a lot of abilities really quickly. However, remember that while the blue buff is the best invade to get you ahead, the speed buff may be the better choice if your team is there with you. Denying the enemy jungler his speed will be more devastating to the entire enemy team rather than just denying the enemy solo his blue. Make sure you're only invading if A, you have a sizable lead and know the enemy team either won't be around to stop you or won't be able to stop you, or B, your team are there with you and you're invading as an entire team. Quick note though, invading just the small minions from an enemy buff can often be the balance point between safety and gains. You get a small invade, but you also keep yourself safe by not staying too long and allowing enemy rotations. Also, it's kind of a given, but make sure you're warding if you have a tendency to invade and be prepared to run if you see that enemy jungler rotating. Alright, recalling or backing, these terms basically just mean the same thing. Recalling correctly is extremely important in solo lane. Solo lane is largely a farm focused role, so missing minions because of a poorly timed back will put you behind and potentially allow the enemy to snowball and invade your jungle. Of course, getting poked out will sometimes force you to back when you don't want to, that's going to happen, but try and minimise it as much as you can. Good times to back are when you've just cleared a wave, the enemy is backing with you, or you're going to finish a full tier 3 item. Alright, we're almost there. The last section is covering team fights and team play. This section is less focused on being a solo laner and more about how to play team fights as a frontline tank. Of course, if you're playing something weird like a mage solo, then this won't apply, just use your knowledge of team fighting as a mage. But as a tank, your main role is to play the frontline. Often, as a warrior or bruiser guardian, you'll want to be up in the enemy's faces, harassing them and doing damage to the enemy backline. Usually, the support will be there to peel for your team, but be aware that sometimes it's better for the overall team fight to hang back and save your hunter's life than chase down that backus on 1 HP. You essentially just want to cause as much chaos as possible as to the enemy team. If you can get to the enemy mage and hunter safely, then you can start to pressure them out and keep them busy with your CC and damage. This will either net you some good damage on them, or force the enemy team to fall back to deal with you, at which point your team can take some ground and start to roll over the enemy team. You're not immortal though. It often feels like it being a solo laner, but you can be killed if you play stupid. Don't dive in without a specific purpose in mind. If you stand to gain nothing from blinking into four people, then don't fucking do it. But if your team is there to follow up and support your dive, then go right ahead. Any experience fighting as a tank will be useful when playing the solo lane, be that from other game modes or other roles, whatever, it's all useful. Bear in mind though, that what you bring to a team fight is hugely dependent on what god you're playing, so play to your god's strengths and your team's strengths and you'll do great. I wish you guys all the best in your solo lane endeavours. Season 5 is one of the best times to be getting into it. If you still have any more questions about the solo lane, then be sure to leave a comment. Either me or some other solo main will be happy to answer it. But anyways, this video has gone on long enough already. Like and share if this helped you out and sub for more videos like this in the future. Catch you guys in the next video. Peace out nerds.